G'day, I'm Dr. Peter Price of Classroom Professor. Welcome to this Math Teacher PD course entitled Early Years Mathematics Foundations. I'd like, you, like to welcome you to the course and say how much I appreciate you being with me. Just to um, let you know where we're going with this, this is, as the title suggests, aimed at teachers of the early years in school. I realise in different systems there may be different titles for that, but I'm ref referring to the first two or three years of a child's schooling. So in Australia, in the state where I live, we have a year called prep, and then we have year one, year two, and so on. I know in other places you have kindergarten or preschool or um, preparatory class and a number of other names for that. But it's for the youngest students. It's to set in place ideas for how to teach mathematics well to the youngest of students who are just learning about mathematics, just learning about numbers, and they're not, at the beginning at least, ready to learn their number facts. So it's that sort of um, area of the curriculum and that sort of age and development level in the student. So once again, welcome to the course. Now the course will be divided into a number of sections. It's, I've planned that there'll be five videos for the five sections and you'll see in the notes that um, that's how the notes are divided up so you can follow along as we go. I'm not scripting this, you can probably tell already, um, but I do have notes to keep me on track so I know where I'm going, I know the key points that I'm going to um, discuss and I hope you find this style you know, it's, I'm trying to be reasonably relaxed, not too uptight, and certainly not read a script to you because I don't think you'd enjoy that so much. So here we go. We're going to start with the first topic. Now, the first section, this first video is entitled Mathematics Foundations. And so we're going to start at the very beginning and really look at what, what we mean by mathematics. Well, not, not what mathematics is, but what are we starting from? What are, the, what are the building blocks? What are some really, really basic ideas? The first one I want to tackle is the difference between numbers and numerals. Now, I assure you that this is of practical importance to teachers, so I'm not going to wax, you know, go all philosophical on you, although it does have a philosophical base. But it's important for teachers to understand this distinction as they teach mathematics um, for the benefit of their students, as I'll explain. So we have these two words. Obviously, the one we use most often in everyday life is numbers. But as a teacher, you will no doubt use the word and have heard the word in your studies at university, uh, the word numerals. And we really need to understand the difference between the two. So in everyday life, people refer to numbers as just a generic term for meaning anything that's got a numerical value to it. But strictly speaking, there is a difference. Numbers are really a concept or an idea. They are related to the Greek idea of having perfect forms that are never actually seen in the physical world that we live in. So if, if I liken this to the idea of a circle, if you say let's draw a circle, you can never draw a perfect circle. The idea of a circle is very clear. Mathematically it's very, very precise, but you could never draw one perfectly. It would always be slightly imperfect. Even if you printed it, it would be made of pixels or dots of ink or something. So we can have this idea that we know what it is. It's this perfect concept. In a, in a sense, it's a sort of source of beauty and perfection, the sort of thing you might imagine in heaven, but on earth we can only see, you know, somewhat crude representations. Numbers are like that. They're an idea that we can understand in a mathematical sense. Internally and cognitively, we can know what a number is, but when we come to record it, that's what a numeral is. So we use numerals all the time in mathematics and they are the symbols, the names, the pictures, the models, the representations, the different forms in which we show, in inverted commas, a number. So when we say, show me the number using blocks or what number is this, if it's a physical form, even if it's a written down form, it's actually a numeral. So I would encourage teachers to use the word correctly it's not really that important, but I think it's, you know, if you're like me and you like to get things right and you like to speak accurately and correctly about things, it's correctly called 
a numeral when you write one down. The idea of how many there is, that's a number. So we refer to both numbers and numerals. But if you say, write for me a three, we should really say, can you write the numeral three? Now, we don't want the students to know these words to, to be able to explain what they mean or necessarily to use them in their correct places. That is something that was recommended when I was a, a very young student teacher in the 70s and that was just the last phase of what was called new math or new maths and the mathematicians were saying there's a distinction between the two and we should let we should make sure that our students know that thank goodness we got over that idea we don't have to be teaching four-year-olds what a numeral is in terms of understanding the meaning of the word and the difference between numeral and number so it's it's a distinction for teachers to understand that's why I'm talking to you about it in this teachers PD course so let's have a look at a numeral here's an example it's a set of objects and we might say to the students how many objects are there can you write it down can you say the word can you spell the word can you write a symbol or a numeral for it whatever we write whatever we say even a different sort of symbol like that uh, a Roman symbol for this number of objects these are called numerals I'll get to the point of explaining why this is important in, in a very short moment but let me just reinforce the point when we record something when we say it it represents the amount it represents the number and the number is a characteristic of the set so here we actually do have four counters the counters themselves though are not the number the number is a characteristic of the set of them in the notes I use the word numerosity and Microsoft Office didn't like that word and said it's not a real word and you know but it's a useful word it's a it's the number of things in the set it's the characteristic it's an attribute of the set if you will now we can almost prove that these are not numbers if you think about it this isn't the only way that we can record the number four in a symbolic form this isn't the only word now only I only know one other word and that uh, sorry one other language and that's French in French that number is called quatre and it's just as much four as the English word four is okay so that's what we mean and in terms of how we show numbers as I said before the representations that we use in the classroom the place value materials the ten frames the counters the dice the pictures all of those different ways of showing a number are numerals now the point of all that is this and the reason why this is important is that when we are dealing with mathematics we are dealing with ideas it's very much a discipline which has as its source as the objects of study if you like ideas they're all ideas we write down representations we write numerals so that we've got a record of it and we can remind ourselves of where we're up to and we can do algorithms and we can record formulae and all that sort of thing but the ideas themselves are just that they're ideas and the reason I think that's important is that your students need to uh, need to be developing this conceptual understanding that really happens in their head somewhere in their imagination in their visualization it doesn't happen in the physical pictures and the blocks and the dots and the counters and the resources that you use so every time we're teaching mathematics we're wanting our students to think about it and as I said before to picture it to visualize it up here in the brain because when we as I've said already when you show it in a physical form it's not actually the number it just represents the number so in the sense in a sense in the sense that the the ancient Greeks I believe understood it um, the representations that we use are standing in place of the idea so as we are teaching mathematics to our students we'll use lots of representations and particularly in this early years course I will talk about different resources that you can use in the last section of the course and I thoroughly recommend that your students use those a lot the only thing I want to uh, reiterate and to emphasize at this point is that those are not the numbers 
the numbers of these ideas that students have to understand. I'd love to hear your comments about this section. If you feel this has been too difficult, too philosophical, do let me know. Um, but um, that's the end of that section and I, I truly do hope that you've, you've caught what I'm saying and that you agree that um, you know, there's some important information, important understandings um, in what I've just said. So let's move on. The next slide is entitled, in the notes that is, Cognitive Processing Basics. Now I hasten to add I'm not a psychologist, I don't have a degree in psychology, but my understanding of how mathematics is learned and um, what mathematics is and, and how students understand mathematics, it gives me enough um, ammunition, if you like, that I can talk to you about uh, the basics of cognitive processing. So. The first thing to recognise is that there are different ways of thinking and there are different aspects of cognitive processing which are relevant and are important in what happens in the student's head as they learn mathematics. So as I've said in the notes, there's obviously memory and memory is important both in the short term and the long term. So in other words, as we know, short-term memory is used to remember things that you don't need to remember for a long time. It's just for the, you know, the here and now. So there are various times when we would ask, we will ask students to do something, and we want them to remember what we've said and go away and do it. And you know, so there's relevance for knowing short-term, sorry, for remembering short-term certain things. But oftentimes we want students to rem remember things long-term, and I'm referring here to number facts. As I said at the beginning of this video, the very early years don't include the memorization of number facts, but it's important that students are developing an understanding that will eventually lead to learning number facts. And in fact, if they start to remember some number facts early, that's a, you know, that's a good idea and I wouldn't stop them from doing it. But we need to keep in mind that there is a memory aspect, that students will be expected to remember things, and of course they've got brains that are capable of doing that. So we shouldn't shy away from expecting students to remember things because we somehow think that it's old fashioned and it's rote learning and you know we've got calculators to do that now. That would be a grave mistake in my view. We use calculators for all sorts of things and they're absolutely brilliant at what they do, but they don't take away the benefit of being able to remember things and in particular uh, number facts. Uh, later on they'll learn formulae and um, there'll be all sorts of basic structural understanding, <coughs> excuse me, understandings that will be part of their long-term memory of mathematics. The next one I refer to in the notes is making sense and this again is something that I want to emphasize. I see a lot of materials for the teaching of maths. I watch YouTube videos as you probably do. Um, I observe other teachers teaching mathematics. I observe student teachers doing it because I currently work at university level and so I get to go into classrooms and watch students teach. So I've seen a fair bit of practice and a lot of times I think there are teachers who are asking students to follow procedures without expecting them to understand what's going on. So I'm not going to speak for, for uh, you know, at great length about this right at the moment, but it is one of the themes in my beliefs about what is good pedagogy of teaching mathematics. It's not about procedures. It's not about learning how to follow a series of steps to complete a particular process without any understanding. We need our students to understand. We need them to make sense of what's going on so that they can apply it in new situations. We don't want a generation of students who are stuck in some sort of, I don't know how to describe it, it's sort of like being in a time warp or like little robots that can only do certain things because they're the only ones they've been trained to do. We need to educate our students to be able to think as human beings, as you know, functioning rational beings who can make sense of situations as adults and older students. So at every point, including in the early years, I think it's really, really important that students can make sense of what they're doing. So at every point, in every single lesson of teaching mathematics, I would encourage you to ask students to make sense of what they're learning. 
So even if you are learning something that is perhaps fairly methodical and routine and this is a set of steps and procedures, at every point I would ask the students to explain what they're doing and do you understand and you know, use models and language and pictures and diagrams and so on to help them make sense of it for themselves. The goal being one of the um, uh, indications that the, the method is working if you like is to have students say, I understand, I get it, you don't need to explain it, and that, you know, they want to go away and do it themselves because they've got it. And it's this idea again of processing up here in the brain. Um, I refer to assimilating. You, you want to help students, and that's a Piagetian idea of assimilating new information into existing schemas. So as we learn new information, even in this course as I'm teaching you things and, and you know explaining things and giving you notes you'll be connecting this and slotting it into places in your own understanding of mathematics and teaching it and you know pedagogy and all those things your students will do the same thing but I think you should help them so I think it's, it's you know and I'm sure you agree with me if you're a teacher a mark of a good teacher is someone who can help students to make those connections so I would recommend you do that quite explicitly quite overtly so that when you have a topic and you can see this connects with fractions and you know percentages and place value that you point that out to students and show them the connection so that they can make the connection so cognitively in their thinking they are developing really a very complex mental map a, a schema for understanding mathematics and all the different pieces are connected together um, and you can assist them in, in that process. So we want that to happen, absolutely. The last thing we want, the, the, the most limited thinking I can imagine for a student learning mathematics is to have a whole lot of pigeonholes. And of course I'm speaking in figurative terms, but if you can imagine understanding little pieces of information that are in little separated boxes and they're categorised but they're separate from each other, like a set of pigeonholes where you put mail for different people and they're not supposed to be in two boxes at once, they're all separate. We don't want to learn mathematics that way. We want our students to have, as I mentioned before, like a concept map, like where you've got bubbles that are connected and, and it's not even fixed, they're fluid, so you can move things around and as you develop more understanding you add extra pieces onto the, you know, onto the, the bubble as you, as you were. If you've used bubbles, you know what I'm talking about, the idea of a concept map and connected ideas, you can add new ones, you can go off and create whole subsets of new information, that sort of idea. Okay, and the, the next point in the notes is building categories and connections. So as well as the information that all connects together in a concept map sort of way, another organiser, if you like, for understanding what it is that's going on is that we're building categories and connections in a, a more formalised sense, I suppose. So conceptually we're going to make connections all over the place, but we will help our students to categorise what they're learning. So for example in geometry there's an awful lot of categories. So we'll teach them the different sorts of angles and the different sorts of plane shapes and the ones with straight edges are all called polygons and then we have circles and ovals and you know then we go into three dimensional shapes and, and we help them make all those connections but we help them to categorise it so that they understand the history if you like of the different forms and the different terminology that we use. So at every point we want to be accurate, we want to be true to the roots of mathematics, the language of mathematics, the correct forms and you know we'll get on to that further as we go into the course no doubt. And then we come to the idea of coaching students. I came across this in a book I was reading the other day about differentiating for instruction and one of the points that the author made, her name is um, Carol Tomlinson so I wouldn't mind, I'm quite happy to promote her work, I think she writes brilliantly about differentiation and has done for some decades now. She wrote about coaching students for success and I thought what a fantastic idea. It's, it's a bit like the idea of leadership that in leading other people in an organisation, in a team, you need to help them to function well as a member of the team and help them to develop their own leadership and so on. And I've come to the view that teaching is like that with our students, that we're not just passing out information and saying here learn this and do this homework and that sort of thing, but we're encouraging our students to achieve success 
almost at an um, it's not at an equal level with the teacher because they're never going to you know be as old as us and, and have the same seniority and the same level of experience but in the future they will and so it's this idea of helping to raise them up to a higher level help them understand things before they need to almost and as I said coach them for success so I would encourage you in teaching your students mathematics to help them to function mentally as they learn mathematics by helping them with memory and you know I'll be talking about strategies for learning number facts and there'll be separate PD courses for that as well you want to help your students do that so it's not just an instruction from the teachers go away and learn this and when you come back I'm going to t give you a test but to really help them so you, if they don't get it you know give them another way of understanding it and so on and tell them how we think about it as adults and if you do this this will help you so I think that idea is a very powerful one as I said of coaching students for success and lastly in this area of cognitive processing think about the differences between the ways that boys and girls think and the strengths and the weaknesses that they have we know that girls are very strong in the area of language they're very social they understand emotions a lot better they communicate a lot more and I think that's true of men and women women tend to use a lot more words apparently when we men get home from work and we've spoken all the words we need to for that day and we sit down in front of the TV our wife who may have been at home with the children or just um, it may be at work herself she's got a whole lot more words that she needs to say that day and so we should be listening more okay I'm getting off topic a little bit but that's a strength in the female brain the female brain is structured differently apparently again I'm not a psychologist but from what I've read about it um, there are distinct differences between the way men and women and males and females even at a young age think um, boys will find that harder they find the social interaction much harder males are more focused they're able to focus on one thing uh, to the exclusion of all others and if you are married you'll know what I'm talking about but whether you're male or female that men tend to focus quite well on tasks and that's that's a great strength in some ways but it can be a weakness if somebody wants to talk to us while we're watching TV get back to the TV example again okay but we can help boys and girls to think using the strengths that they've got and we can look and obviously we can look at their interests as well but just in terms of their social interaction and the way they they work and obviously you will dif differentiate for the individual students in your class anyway but I just wanted to highlight this idea that there are as I said gender differences um, in the ways of thinking and they're all important and they're all positive and I wouldn't dream of you know saying one was better than the other they're just different and we should acknowledge that and we can help our students to develop the strengths that they need so for one thing they we can help boys to communicate better and to socialize better and all those sort of things let's got not get too far off track okay the third section in this part of the video I'm going to go back to the whiteboard for a moment the third section is entitled number systems so what I'm referring to here is the fact that as we use numbers and of course numerals to record the numbers there are system excuse me there are systems for doing that so one obvious system is the base 10 system so let's look at that for a moment if you think about a symbol for a number like that a numeral representing a number 3574.925 every digit has a particular value it has its own face value so this is a 3 which is a separate amount to 5 and that's 7 and we've got 5 twice so those two have the same face value but of course the most important thing is their place value and understanding what they represent in the place where they are of course I realize this isn't an early years number it's not an early years example but it's just to illustrate the point we use certain symbols and there's not really that many we can 
you sort of miss it if we're not careful that there's actually not many different symbols to use. We just have this set. That's the full set of digits. There are no others. And then we have another symbol for decimal fractions, as we've got over here. We have a, a minus sign for negative numbers. And that's pretty much it. Now, there are other mathematical symbols, but to record a numerical amount, we only need those, that's 12 different symbols. And with those 12 symbols, we can represent any finite quantity at all. Infinity is a different story. That's not even a number. It's, it's an idea again, a concept. But for a finite amount that's not infinite, we, we only need these symbols and we use them over and over again. And the values can be anywhere from extremely large to extremely small, just this side of um, infinity, if you like. And we're using the same symbols over and over again. So the point about this is this system, this base 10 system, is incredibly versatile and at the same time potentially confusing. So we shouldn't miss the fact that while we understand it, we think this is easy because we've done this as adults and we know how to write ten thousands and millions and you know all the different places and the decimal fractions, it's really quite straightforward and it's a very consistent system in that every column is ten times the value of the one next to it and you know one tenth of the one the other side and it's left and right depending on which way you're looking at this. We can miss the fact that for children this is potentially horribly confusing and you know they all sort of look the same and they will miss the fact that when you put that there we've made a completely different sort of number and that you know the values all change. I'm trying not to get into all the specifics of it, I, I, I don't want to go down that track. But just this idea that the system, which is incredibly versatile, is also in a sense quite hidden. And so the meanings of the symbols, we don't normally write a T up here to explain to our student that this is a number of tens and an O here for ones and an H for hundreds. But we should if we want our students to understand it. If they're not understanding that, if they need reminding, we'll use these labels or some other form to help them understand the system. And then that, of course, is why we use base 10 materials. Again, we're moving a little bit outside the realm of early years teaching, but not quite. Early years teachers will focus on the numbers up to 10 to start with, which doesn't have place value, up to 9, I should say, 0 to 9, no place value at all. As soon as we go past 9, we're into place value. Because as you know, we write a 1 and a 0, two digits, and the 1 means a collection of 10 ones, and the 0 means no extras, and then we, we move on from there. So from the moment we get to 10, we're dealing with place value. So even early years teachers have to deal with this system. And it's really important. I mean, you know, as an early years teacher, how important it is to set in place the right foundations in every area. but. Principally, I would say in English and maths, mathematics, sorry. I should apologize at this point. If I say maths, if you're in America, you, you call it math. I understand that. I know that very well. In Australia, we call it maths. In the UK, we call it maths. So um, I'm trying to use both a little bit interchangeably. So forgive me if it, if it uh, bothers you a little bit. So lost track now. <laughs> um, in setting place foundations for students for later learning, for you know, ultimately their life as adults, we need to get it right from the beginning. And in the area of mathematics, we need to get all the systems in place correctly. That's why I talked about numbers and numerals. I think you know, you guys should get it get it right basically in the early years, teach it well so that when the students are moving into the higher grades, grade three, four, five, and you know, on into high school, they've got these really well established fundamental ideas of what we're dealing with. And one of them is this idea of number systems. Another system, so we've, we've dealt with place value as a system. Another system is the, the common fraction notation. And again, this is a bit advanced for early years, but when you start to do fraction work, this is a system. 
And as you know, we've, we've got names for these. We call this a numerator and this a denominator. And if you really want to go to town, you can name the line as well, which is called a vinculum. I don't think you need any of those words with children. They don't need to know the word numerator and denominator, especially in the early years, I mean. Later on, when they're older, they can learn those words. What they need in the early years is an understanding of what it means and, uh, and what on earth this is recording and how this connects with real examples and numerals, you know, examples, circles with pieces cut out and pies and, you know, chopped up pieces of fruit and pictures and all these sort of things. They need to understand all of those in relation to the system. So when we introduce these systems, and they're often systems of um, notation, in other words, how we write it down, we need to thoroughly explain it and give the students lots of opportunities to make those connections I was talking about before, the cognitive connections and the connections between the different topics, so that when you finally let them loose with just symbols and you start doing things in the older grades like, uh, what am I going to do here, something like that, they don't freak out and wonder what on earth they're going to do and try and remember some vague procedure with a hundred steps in it, but they're able to think conceptually, I know what this means. You know, I understand the system, I know what three-sevenths is, I can draw a picture of it, I know what four-fifths is, and I've got an idea of how I'll connect all those together. That's a horribly difficult example to put on the screen. Um, but you understand what I mean, I think? We do give older students examples like that, and if we're not careful, all we'll give them to, to solve that is some complicated process that is really difficult. Lots of adults couldn't even do it anymore when really we need to help them understand what it means so that, you know, as I said before, it makes sense to them. So that's the end of this section, Mathematical Foundations. It, it's gone a bit longer than I expected, to be honest with you, but I think it's really important that we set these in place, as I've said, for the early years. So that's the end of this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.